Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If everybody would try and take a seat, and I think we have some available today. We're a little crowded, but that's because we have a crowded program. Folks, today we're going to start off with getting a good look at the candidates in District 26. So we'll start that in just a few moments. But after that, we're going to take a look at the commissioner race, the one contested commissioner race. Um, and we'll have an opportunity again to ask questions of these candidates. Frankly, the end of the program, we're looking at two candidates for judges. Neither of them are here, not meaning to be overly judgmental. I think we'll wind up finding some way to extend the program and maybe invite some folks to chat. But one of them is, I think, is on the way. So we'll be watching and hopefully we'll have that as well. Ladies and gentlemen, without yakking any longer, let me introduce the gentleman seeking the Democratic nomination for District 26, Mr. Ray Lister. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, having me here this afternoon. My name is Ray Lister, and I'm uh, wanting to run for office for House District 26. I'm a union electrician. I've been an electrician here in Oregon for the last 14 years. And for the last four years, I've actually been working for my union as a membership development and community outreach coordinator. Um, in my time doing that job, what I found is I really enjoy working and advocating for working families. I care about bringing workers together with small businesses and watching both the worker and the, the small business thrive. And that's what I want to do when I go to Salem. I want our, our communities to be places where working families can thrive, but it's impossible to thrive when you're sitting on the freeway. I live in Wilsonville, Oregon. I work over near Portland Airport. Every morning at 6.30 in the morning, I get up and I drive sometimes an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And every evening at 5.30, I drive home sometimes an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Shouldn't take me longer than 45 minutes to get there. It shouldn't take me longer than 45 minutes to get home. So all that extra time is time that I could be volunteering in my community time that I could be spending with my family, time that I could be participating in the district that I live in. But unfortunately, I'm stuck on the freeway. I want to get a transportation package out because when we didn't get a transportation package out last biennium, we left federal dollars on the table. And I think that that's criminal when you see the pro problems that we have right now. It's impossible for working families to participate in their communities when uh, they're worried about whether or not their kids are going to have the proper education when they get to school. To school. I want to see a long-term funding solution to our school system. I want to see teachers have the resources they need. I want to see kids have what they need in the classroom so that their individualized education is exactly what they need to help them thrive and build a career in the future. Um, I have an 11 and a 13-year-old boy. They're both identified as gifted learners. And when I tell people that, they say, that's wonderful, that's great. And, and you're right, it is. It's great. Uh, it's wonderful to watch them grow. It's neat how their brains work. But what people don't understand about gifted, educated, gifted learners is that it's just another special need. I talked to a third grade teacher in Hillsborough who had 38 kids in her class. If my kid was in a class with 38 kids, he would struggle to figure out, to be able to, to advocate for his own needs. We can't ask teachers to do that anymore. We need to solve the funding crisis. We need Oregon to be a good place for working families and small businesses to thrive. And that's why I'm running. Love to, I'd love to ask any, uh, answer any questions you might have. Oh, great, great. Thanks. Thank you, Ray. Folks, just to be clear, we're going to have each candidate speak up for 26, speak up to five minutes, and then folks who are paid up members of the forum get to roll over there and ask some questions. So if I may, let me um, ask uh, Rich Vial to come up. He's seeking the Republican nomination for District 26. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and members of the forum. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here today. I think that this kind of an activity is incredibly important in our democratic process. And frankly, running for this particular office has been a lot of fun for me in being able to get out and visit with folks, uh, both in this kind of a setting and at, at the many doors that I've had the opportunity to knock. I can tell you that I've learned more 
in the last eight weeks than I ever imagined I might, and uh, certainly than I've learned in the last 30 years of public service about this democratic process. I want to note that uh, the guy who got me involved in this is sitting here today. His name's Roy Rogers, and I um, blame him for all of this. <laughs> Roy, uh, Roy appointed me to the fair board about 22 years ago. He claims he was 12 at the time. I know better. But that experience uh, gave me a lot of insight into just how difficult it is to operate in a public environment and try to actually accomplish any kind of um, objective that requires people to come together and agree on anything. I will just quickly tell you that in that experience on the fair board as we were looking at trying to uh, modernize the fairgrounds and include more of Washington County's residents in that process, we found that it was going to be more difficult to overcome a lot of the historical issues that had been there. And so I learned something very important at that particular time. I learned that it was much more important to listen than it was to talk. Now, over the last 30 years, as I've had the opportunity to serve here in this area, beginning with service as the uh, fair, excuse me, as the uh, school board member at the Groner School back in 1986, and subsequently as the chair of the Groner School. One of the other things I learned, in addition to the fact that it's more important to listen than to talk, I learned that it's much more important to serve than it is to be served. I started out on the um, Groner School Board because I had six children in the school at that particular time. Now, that was 1986. And my objective in 1986 was to go get on that school board make sure that my kids were in the smallest classes, make sure that my kids had all the opportunities, make sure that my kids were the ones that had the best teachers. I wanted to exercise influence as a member of that school board. I quickly learned that the only way I was going to have any effective way of influencing the decisions of that board was to stop thinking about my own selfish needs and to look at what was in the best interest of all the children in that school. This came home to me one day when I was taken aside by an older member of the school board. And he said, Rich, it's pretty transparent that all you're doing here is trying to make this a better place for your children. If you continue to do that, you will not have the opportunity to be of any influence here nor will your voice ever make a difference. I'm grateful for the fact that he took me aside and, and um, gave me a bit of a talking to in that respect. The third point that I want to make in terms of this service opportunity is that I know that health and relationships are the most important things to our happiness in life. I've been very fortunate to have a great family a wife that's stuck with me for a little over 40 years now, a number of wonderful children, and now many grandchildren. But I also know that that narrow opportunity to experience happiness with them is primarily going to be enhanced by service to others. I am really glad that we have the opportunity in this society to run for office, to try and make a difference, and to experience the joy that comes when we can exercise the opportunity to perform service. I'm proud of the 30 years of service that I've had the opportunity to do so far, and I look forward to continuing that in the Oregon legislature. Thank you very much. Thank you. And another candidate seeking the Republican nomination, would John Boylston please come up to the front? Thank you, John.
Thank you so much for having me. I am John Wilson, and I'm running for state representative because I want to build on the things that are working here in our local communities and change the things that aren't working in Salem. I grew up just down the road in Cedar Hills. I went to Ridgewood Elementary, Cedar Park Middle School, and Sunset High School, and I thrived in the Beaverton Public Schools. From there, I went to California for college and the University of Southern California for law school. And I admit, I did live in Los Angeles for a few years, but please don't hold my time there against me. It just reinforced how much Oregon is home. Uh, now my wife and I are proud to live in King City, just down the road from Washington Square Mall, where I work as an estate planning attorney in the Lincoln Center there. And we're so proud to be home and be part of this community. So why, are we, why am I running? Oregon is blessed with such incredible natural resources, incredible opportunities here, and the biggest blessing to Oregon is that it's filled with Oregonians. We have such hardworking, creative, passionate people here, and yet despite all these advantages, the state is failing us. It's failing you and your businesses, it's failing your kids, and it's failing your parents. So let's start with our kids. The American dream has always been built on a foundation of hard work, and education. By failing so badly at education, the state of Oregon has taken away the American dream from an entire generation of our kids. We have great teachers in Oregon. My mom was a public school teacher. But we're asking them to compete in the Indy 500 of educational races, and we're giving them a horse and buggy to do it in. We have to modernize our school system. Just down the road, a couple blocks from here, is a K-8 school, a Loa Huber K-8. And they're doing amazing things with that student population. And they're doing it with the same dollars that every other school is getting. Their test results at the seventh grade level are 15% better at English than the state average. That's great in and of itself. But what's even more amazing about that, that student population, more than half of them don't speak English in their home. So this is a school that is predominantly English as a second language students, and yet they do 15% better than the state average in English. There is something working in that school. I've talked to the principal. There is examples there that we need to use for all the schools in the state because they're getting more out of the same dollars. Right. And along with this, we have to have more vocational and career technical education training in our schools. We need more electricians. When Intel builds a new facility, I keep hearing that a lot of the electricians there are coming from Washington because we don't have enough trained electricians here in Oregon. And it's also modern vocations like computer programming. We need their jobs becoming available at Oregon companies in the modern economy, and we need to make sure our kids are ready for those modern jobs. We can make these changes, and they're cost effective. Next, let's talk about our families and our small businesses. The politicians in Salem show a fundamental ignorance of economic reality and a distaste for the free market. They do not appreciate or understand or potentially even care how all of their regulations make it harder to do business in Oregon compared to doing business in other states. We are pushing companies out of Oregon rather than welcoming them in. That has to change. I talked to business owners like Mark Biggie at Al's Garden Center, and he doesn't want a handout or a special deal or anything. He just wants the state to get out of his way. He wants to be able to earn a living based on his own hard work. He's willing to put in the time. Let's make sure that it can work for him and that he can, his business can thrive here based on his efforts. And finally, let's talk about our seniors. As an estate planning and elder law attorney, I have represented the victims of elder financial abuse. Well, let's say it plainly. The state is not doing enough to investigate and enforce our elder financial abuse laws. The first job of a state should be to protect those who have worked so hard for so long but can no longer protect themselves. We have to change this. The state has to investigate and enforce elder financial abuse. If we do these three things, if we get the state out of the way of our businesses so that they can thrive, if we modernize our education system so that our kids have a chance at the American dream, and if we protect our seniors by enforcing our laws, then all Oregonians will have a chance to thrive. So that's why I'm running to be state representative, because there are things that are working here in our community, and I'm going to build on those while making sure that we change the things that aren't working in Salem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now, if there are questions, questioners need to line up here. And as a quick reminder, <clears throat> pardon me, as a quick reminder, only paid up members of the forum can ask questions. And another reminder for those of you that haven't heard me say this 2,000 times, if someone wants to buy a membership, 
this gentleman right here moving the camera will sell it to you in a heartbeat. Others will as well, but he's very good at it. So uh, it, when you come up, you'll have 30 seconds to ask your question. Question period at this point is limited to about 10 minutes. And uh, the candidates will have up to two minutes to respond. Please make it clear whom you're asking the question of. If it's all candidates, that's fine. Uh, we have our first questioner. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, my name is Bill Kroger. I'm a former member. Thanks so for coming in today, you guys. And this is for whoever wants to answer it. I was just curious if you thought the legislature should have a role in the homeless issue, uh, especially as it pertains to Portland. It's a real serious problem there. Thanks for the question. Bill, I think that uh, the homeless issue is something all of us should be concerned about. The idea that we can look upon our neighbor uh, without shelter and not be concerned about it is abhorrent to me. And I think it is uh, completely inconsistent with our philosophy as Oregonians. However, one of my passions is land use. I currently serve as the uh, Planning Commission Chairman for Washington County. I remain convinced that one of the biggest problems we have is that we are planning our housing particularly at the state level, meaning that our local leaders are not given the opportunity to really address the problems that exist. If elected, I intend to do all that I can to push those decisions that are so critical to this issue of homelessness as well as other issues. Just the mere fact of affordability is directly tied to how we deal with our land use issues. And therefore, I think we should be making those decisions as a, at a local level, taking as many of the unreasonable and unnecessary restrictions out of the process so that that affordability question can be directly addressed. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I think that affordable housing, the homelessness issue is part of the larger issue of affordable housing here in Oregon. And it is something that needs to be addressed at all levels of government here in the state because it is such a problem. But when we look at this issue, we have to make sure that the solutions we come to are not going to actually exacerbate the problem and are not going to make housing less affordable for middle class families. For instance, a lot of people talk about a solution of uh, rent control and or subsidized housing what that will do, though, is will create housing affordable for one section of the population of Oregon. And then the ultra-rich can afford housing as well, but the middle class, there's less housing available for them. So we need to make sure that any solution we come to doesn't exacerbate the problem. We need to have a larger supply of housing as a whole. Right? We just need more homes, more units. If you look at the statistics we're at, we're still well behind where we should have been in terms of housing starts since the recession. We just need more houses here, and anything we can do at a state level to make building more homes in the local community is possible, I think we should do. Thank you. Briefly, I just want to make sure that it, we, aren't, we aren't limiting this to just a problem of homelessness. Homelessness is obviously part of the problem, but we also need to make sure that we're creating affordable housing solutions for all areas of the workforce, workforce, whether you're starting out brand new, whether you're trying to rebuild from tough times, or whether, regardless of where you are in your life, there's got to be housing options for everybody. The fact that homelessness is going up and that housing is, is becoming less affordable, that's a crisis that we need to face together. We can't take a partisan stance on it. We can't take a, uh, we can't, we, we need to bring all of our tools to the table and approach it like I would as a negotiator. What I do is I bring all the parties into the room and we sit down together and figure out what's going to work for everybody. Bring business there, bring workers there, bring homeless advocates there, and let's just talk. We can get out of this, we, we can solve these crises by not throwing rocks at each other from op opposite sides of the aisle, we can do it by working together and, and focusing on what needs to be done, and that's creating a broad range of housing opportunities. We have time for one more question. Jaime? Uh, Jaime Rodriguez, and thank you guys all for being here, number one, just stepping up for this job. It can't be easy, but I, I appreciate it, and we all do. Um, housing, um, House District 26, it's, uh, it's pretty vast, it's pretty wide, it's pretty it's not the greatest thing as far as the, the distance from one place to the other. I live in would be um, northern Hillsboro, um, where uh, there are big plans to build up on 
South Hillsboro, and I'm concerned about not just the congestion that's going to come on, but the infrastructure for blessing and poor, again, the affordable housing. But more importantly, also, is, you know, are there, are, there, are there going to be jobs there to support what is going to amount to about 20,000 plus more residents? Are we going to have the jobs, and if the jobs are there, are they going to be supported to, to be able to afford uh, these housing that are going to come in? And also, one part is, is that so much affordable housing? We have to define what affordable is. So any suggestions about that South Hillsboro area, I think I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Jaime. That, uh, that really does go back to something I was talking about a moment ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to do that. The reality is that House District 26 is a very interesting district. <laughs> it is um, Wilsonville, Sherwood, Shoals, Cooper Mountain, um, South Hillsboro, which is just going to explode. Uh, up across the freeway on TV Highway in that uh, Brown Middle School area. This is a very, very diverse district. Um, we, in our campaign, we've come to call it the Not Portland District. And part of the reason we're using that term is that because so many of these communities are saying, we know we're going to grow, we know we have to grow, but we don't necessarily want to grow the same way Portland does. And that's why I was making the point a moment ago of how important I think local decision making is when it relates to these land use issues. I will tell you that I think that House District 26, because of the great diversity that it has, has the potential and in all likelihood will be one of the most important players in our upcoming legislative um, issues. Not just this biennium, but in the, well into the future, as this district grows, the problems that it faces and the solutions that I believe it will come up with will, pro will provide leadership for the entire state. We've got everything from rural to very dense urban in this district, and I think we're going to see some very exciting things come about as a result. And I hope that we can do it with folks like you uh, providing that local input about just exactly what solutions we should put in place. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, first part that you talked about, jobs. Absolutely. Jobs is a solution to so many of Oregon's problems right now. And to make sure that especially in the Hillsboro area and that we have the jobs that we need, we've got to make sure we take away any regulation that's making it harder for businesses to grow. Right. We need to make it easier for businesses to compete, not harder. So IP28, this ballot measure that's coming down the pike. I've heard from businesses, especially large ones like Intel, that if it passes, they will integrate, vertically integrate some of their supply chains currently. Currently, they're buying from a number of smaller suppliers, smaller companies around the state. If they, IP28 passes, you pay a tax at every time you buy a good and it goes through the corporate chain. So. If they have to do that, they'll pay, end up paying 10% or 7.5% more on the goods they're going to be manufacturing out at Intel. If that's too much for them. They'll just bring it all in-house. That's going to lose jobs for all those smaller companies that are currently supplying to Intel. We have to look at our policies and understand the larger economic implications of them. So this is just one of them. We have to do everything we can to help companies in Oregon grow, and that way they'll have the jobs for all the people out in Hillsboro. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to the second phase. First of all, please let me thank all of the folks here that from 26. And they all can't win, but at least two of them can come next week. So thank you again. The Washington County Public Affairs Forum is committed to looking at both sides of an issue, or I should say all sides of an issue. I've been alive long enough to realize that few issues have just two sides. And when there are candidates, all candidates are invited. We're going to take a look at the one contested commission race coming up in just one half of a second, but I did want you to know that both candidates were invited, and R Commissioner Rogers, the incumbent, is sitting right here. We'll introduce him in just a second. Ms. Claybrooks did, in fact, confirm his opponent. She was to be here, but we just found out that she started a new job, and she sends her regrets she is unable to arrange to be here. As a result, uh, 
have the pleasure of introducing Commissioner Rogers, who is seeking re-election. Commissioner Rogers, please. There we go. Thank you for the introduction. I uh, was uncertain I was going to get here on time. We were dealing with a little $2 billion project for a uh, kind of light rail project coming into from Portland into uh, my particular district, and we had some interesting votes to take today. I was um, thinking back, and it's been a while since I first appeared before the forum, and I have to confess to each and every one of you, I looked a bit younger in those days, but I see some of my friends in the audience, and I have to tell you, you looked a bit younger as well. So we've, uh, I think, all aged gracefully <laughs> together, and it's been a, a nice experience. Thanks to the candidates, I uh, see people with uh, no experience. I see people with uh, a little bit of experience, and then you see folks like myself who've been around a bit, and we come with uh, different perspectives and different viewpoints, but I really admire those who will put themselves out and answer your questions and attempt to uh, bring fresh new ideas and thoughts and, and uh, run the kinds of races that uh, we all have to run. It's, it's very time consuming. I can uh, uh, certainly attest to that. I, I also want to say that this is a very unique county. I think you may all know that. Uh, we're unique in terms of who we are, where we are, and where we're going. You probably uh, know that we put about 11,000 new people in this county every year. So that's a, a, a new city that uh, crops up and we have to provide services. And I'd give you a glimpse of my, my day as a commissioner every day, and these are kind of interesting statistics. There's 27 new people who move into Washington County every day. Every day, four new companies come here and 24 new jobs are created. Every day, we register 40 new passenger vehicles every day. So no wonder the streets are crowded. Um, things that uh, you might find interesting, about four new students every day register in the Beaverton School District. Uh, 2,500 additional gallons of water are consumed, so we need fresh water. Obviously, there's a lot going on. So who am I? Some of you I have not had the pleasure of uh, meeting. I've served on the commission for a fair number of years now. Before that, I was the mayor of 12 for three terms. I serve as a, uh, I'm a CPA by occupation and have an expertise in municipal finance, and so I, I deal with uh, all of the county issues in terms of budget and finance and audit and those sorts of things, so that's my background. I uh, also negotiate all of the, uh, as the county negotiator on the intel, so that little $100 billion deal, that was uh, an interesting uh, negotiation process. So I was uh, doing that for the county. I also uh, do all of the transportation issues for many years. I serve as the chair of the, what we call WCCC, which is all of the MISTIP, all these acronyms, but uh, that's about $35 million a year that we spend in the county on just from that one source, uh, and I, I chair that, and it's all the mayors. I also serve as the longest sitting member on JPAC, which is the uh, regional transportation uh, entities out of Metro, and we deal with all state and federal, and then I serve as the chair of the Four County Act for ODOT, and what that is is that uh, we deal with all state monies in the Clackamas, Multnomah, Hood River, and Washington County. So I'm a bit immersed, uh, and those who uh, have an interest in transportation, if we had more time, they told me I had five minutes, so I have to speak uh, very quickly, but I'd be happy to answer questions on transportation. I also have a th third uh, and fourth legs of things I do. I have always historically been very involved with clean water services. We serve as their board, as you probably know, and uh, have dealt with a variety of issues and some pretty innovative things that we're, we're doing right now. And for including forming a new captive insurance agency. We're just in the uh, final phase of that. You can't do it here in Oregon, so we had to go to Hawaii to, to do that, but uh, haven't gone to Hawaii, but that's where it's, it's formed. And then I also serve um, on the executive uh, committee for what we call Work Systems, Inc. So that's all our workforce issues and, and dealing with the various uh, things that we have uh, there. Well, why am I running? We're the economic engine of the state of Oregon. It does doesn't happen overnight. We spent a lot of time dealing with what all is important uh, in, in this particular county in terms of growth, uh, managing it, making it continue, it, continue to make it livable. We've uh, made certain that uh, we've addressed uh, without any ta big tax increases 
all of the issues that confront you on a daily basis. Are there challenges? Of course. With an exploding population, we have challenges, and we're going to continue to meet that, including mental health, which is becoming one of our largest and uh, most uh, difficult issues to, to span, and housing. I'm happy to answer questions. There's some systemic issues in regard to housing that I'd uh, love to get into. Again, we have very limited time. So he's flashing at me. I don't know whether that means uh, in a good way, right? In a good way. All right, in a good way. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I want you to, in a little bio we're going to hear from two judges, I want to make it clear I've never flashed anybody. Um, if speakers would, or questioners would like to line up, that would be great. Um, the commissioner will have about 10 minutes to answer questions. <laughs> I am Spencer Herman, member of the forum. Um, the, uh, the folks that are running for uh, House District uh, 26 earlier spoke to local control um, a little bit. And um, uh, in some ways, uh, the state of Oregon uh, Department of Environmental Quality has abrogated their responsibilities um, to uh, protect the health of uh, Oregonians, particularly in the Portland metro area. I appreciate the phrase, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not Portland, uh, for some of the folks from 26. But the fact is, we all, share, we all live in the uh, Portland metro area, uh, rich, and um, uh, we, we all breathe the same air. And as we've seen in, uh, in, in Portland uh, during the last three months, uh, there's been a, a, a catastrophe um, in the lack of uh, uh, DEQ's work to protect our air quality. There's a movement going on between Portland and Multnomah County to reform the Columbia Willamette Air Quality Board. Um, and what I want to know is, is to what extent will uh, the Washington County Commission be willing to uh, talk to them and work with them to reform a uh, metropolitan area air quality commission that will do a better job of protecting our air than Department of Environmental Quality has. I'll try to pick that up. That was a series of questions and a, and a statement there, but uh, we work very closely with DEQ. We have a testing site out at Hare Field, or Hare Field in, uh, in Hillsboro uh, that they're looking at attainment. We have obviously uh, issues to deal with. Uh, the person you see as their spokesman, DEQ on TV, I work uh, with her frequently in, in, in terms of uh, of uh, JPAC, but I also work in regard to the airshed issues that we have in Washington County. And you may not know this, and it's not popular, but we have uh, an issue with wood burning stoves. And we've been monitoring that for the last uh, year. Uh, it's difficult because for many people, that's the only thing they have to heat their homes. And so we, we've gone through uh, the last year uh, of attempting to notify people of what those issues are look to see if there isn't some state incentive for all of you running for state office, uh, if there isn't some uh, sort of uh, energy credit uh, uh, ability to uh, assist people in converting. But now let's get to your specific question in regard to uh, should there be some kind of a, a regional uh, solution? Of course, we're all in the same airship. We agree to that. We may disagree on, on who does that. Um, and I, I, I know that some would say that we need to have some new organization because DEQ has done a poor job in terms of monitoring. And I, I'm not certain that I would get there myself personally. And the reason I say that is that the uh, DEQ is obviously a, a, a creature of the legislature and uh, the uh, standards are established by, by those who write those laws. Uh, and from what I can gather and what I've seen, uh, not being an expert on air quality, but knowing a little bit about it, I think that they've done their job. Um, the question is, is what should be their job, and I think those in the Portland metropolitan area, which I wholeheartedly agree with your comment, were one airshed, um, and need to say, how do we define that with those elected down at the state capitol, and what, what would that look like, and what quality should we have, and what would our expectations be? So um, we uh, have not come to a conclusion on that issue. We're looking and saying, is it better to work within the existing system, or do you set up a new apparatus with new costs and new administration? Um, and so I'm always interested in hearing it. Where we'll go with it, I don't know, but that's the issue. I remember when Harry, you used to come out to the county all the time. 
Harry Bodine, forum member. Always good to see you. <clears throat> we live at the north end of 217. And the joke in the neighborhood is it's the safest highway in Oregon because traffic moves at five miles an hour from about noon until who knows when. Basically, uh, we have four lanes at the north end of the highway that funnel down to two in Beaverton. I know it's a state highway, not a county road. But what in the world can we do about 217? 217. So the traffic might flow at, say, 30 miles an hour? Well, the bottlenecks are obviously where I reside uh, and where I represent is in the south, and then obviously it resides in, in the north as well. 217 um, has been a, a big issue. I uh, have half a billion dollars to fix it. Uh, ODOT has been doing some work in regard to um, ITS, which is an intelligent, intelligent transportation system, trying to move uh, traffic uh, a little better. It's, it's a big issue. Um, but Harry, it, it's hard to find that kind of money. You know that, and I, I, I know that. Uh, we've not been successful with any increased gas taxes. The county has one penny, plus we get about $35 million a year in MSTI funds. That's certainly not going to crack that egg at all, not when we have so many other needs. But uh, one of the proposals that uh, TriMet might float and uh, it's coming out would be a regional uh, bond issue, which would uh, not only address the Southwest Corridor, but would uh, look at three different projects. One's the, I, and I'll get to ours fast, I-205, because uh, they've got some issues, the Rose Quarter and 217. And what scale that will be, I mean, that's under discussion, and that's very preliminary, but uh, it's an age-old problem. I don't see any more, but I would like to answer the question that they got to answer on, they, there's a, on housing, affordable housing. It, it, there's some systemic issues and it's not an easy question, and it's uh, not that we haven't thought about it at great length. What the issue is is that you have a confined urban growth boundary, and we all like that as Oregonians. I'm born and raised too. But we all know about supply and demand. If you have no supply, things get real expensive. If we had one glass of water and we only all were bidding on it, we'd probably go pretty high. Well, we have this confined growth boundary, and so land is, is soaring. It's about uh, seven, 800,000 an acre developable right now lot of money and so what do you do in terms of, of, of uh, increasing the supply well that's up to the legislature and the, and the metro um, there's uh, some other uh, interesting issues they could do a lot of cities have height impediments you can only go to two to three stories should we start looking at higher f higher uh, buildings uh, especially in core city areas I have a bit of problem I wish my opponent were here she likes inclusionary zoning I have a bit of a problem on inclusionary zoning, uh, and the reason I do, uh, it doesn't work for people who have special kinds of, uh, of financial barriers. You can't put, uh, as one of my colleagues on my boards keeps saying, well, why don't we put more affordable housing in North Bethany? To do what? I mean, people need transit, they need walkable communities, they need grocery stores, they need, they need uh, doctors, they need things that they can get to very easily. So. The housing that you need for affordable has to be in, 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 along light rail lines or on transit lines, has to be in some kind of a city. But these cities, and they're, all of them are about the same, they're, they're compressing the height. They don't want tall buildings. Well, if you understand how it works, you either go up or you go down, and then with water tables, it's not so good to go down. So if, you, if you're, if you're going to go up, you've got the same footprint on the building and the same roof. Why couldn't you look at mixed housing? I mean, that's one of the solutions. Look at mixed housing and the uh, two bottom uh, layers or two or three floors might be uh, retail and, and commercial, and then you have affordable housing up above. I mean, there are, there are incentives, but developers, and um, I, I talked to many of them, are, are concerned about how you, how you do it with the current structure of no land, and they can sell for a lot more than affordable housing, and height restrictions. So. Uh, got to look at the systemic reasons why we got here and then hopefully the legislature and all those fine people who are running and uh, looking at these things can say it's, it's not an easy as just sitting around the table and talking. We've done that. Come up with some creative solutions to get us out of the problem. So, i sorry I took, a I, I took a question I wasn't even asked. Well, I think it's wonderful that you answered the questions that you were asked and we seldom have, have folks wanting to add some more that haven't been asked, but thank you for doing it, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
If any of the candidates that have already spoken have a chance to hang on for another 20 minutes or so, there may be some people here who didn't get a chance to ask a question that will want to corner you friendly in a corner. Um, we do have the two candidates for judges. Would they kindly come up here, please, and have a seat? Uh, Tom Markle and Ted Sims are here, and I believe we tossed a coin and it was uh, Tom that was going to go first. Is that correct? Oh, it's Ted that's going first. Okay. Yes, and it, I'm sorry, I thought that was right. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any uh, continued words from me, uh, would Tom, uh, Tom Markle. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's actually Tim Marble. Um, when you look at the ballot, make sure to look for Tim, Tim not, Tim, Tom. not Tom. Yeah, that's right. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in, a, in Forest Grove. I was the youngest of nine children. Uh, there were seven boys and two girls. Uh, my dad had a cabinet shop. I picked strawberries from the time I was five years old, and then when I was old enough to work in the cabinet shop, I learned how to make cabinets. My brothers took over the cabinet shop and had a construction business. I was the youngest. I was the, I was the guy that got stuck going under the house to change out the insulation and change the plumbing and, and to dig out the sewer systems. Not a fun job. I also learned to scrape paint off of houses. And scraping paint off a house is slightly more interesting, I think, than a judicial campaign. Because there's not much that happens in a judicial campaign. We can't talk very much about the issues that uh, have already been addressed here before you today, like the issues of homelessness. Although, um, when you're talking about the homeless issues, um, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting to me because uh, there's a guy in Forest Grove named Bob. Bob uh, has shopping carts that he totes all around the city of Forest Grove. He wears a motorcycle helmet. Um, and a lot of people think it was this homeless guy who lives on the streets in Forest Grove, and that is true, but he's not technically homeless because he has a home, he has an apartment. His problem is not just homelessness, it's also mental health. So you can't address an issue of homelessness as just a housing issue, it's also an issue of mental health, it's an issue of aging, um, it's an issue, it's a much larger issue. Um, that's interesting to me running for judge because uh, that's an issue that comes to the courts. You have people who come to the courts who um, have less than full capacity issues, and those need to be taken into consideration, that, that their voice is heard when they come to the court. It may be the result of aging. It may be a result of mental health. It may be other disabilities. But that's very important, I think, for us as citizens in order to address those issues. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you just a little bit about my background let you know who I am. Uh, as I said, I grew up in Forest Grove. I graduated from high school at Forest Grove High School. I was in uh, the band. I marched in the Rose Festival Parade twice. I was involved in student leadership. I was student, lead, uh, student body vice president. I played the drums in the marching band. I played oboe in the uh, symphonic band. And I played tenor sax in the, in the jazz band. Now, that's just high school. When I went to college, I also was in, involved in music there. My one claim to fame in college was I played for Dizzy Gillespie. Um, they needed a Barry Sachs player. Um, what's interesting is not that, that I was any good. It's only interesting that they needed one note played. So I, I, I played in this band with, and played only one note, uh, which uh, actually was fascinating not for playing, but for the stories he told backstage um, on the Riviera, Riviera with Clark Terry. Um, a very educational experience for a young kid from a small town in Oregon. After college, I went to Divinity School at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, think of the Divinity School at Vanderbilt as a belt buckle with a peace sign on it in the middle of the Bible belt. It's a very interesting place, and in the mid-80s, as you can imagine, it was also um, ex an extraordinary place to be because you were thrust in the middle of uh, people who were discoursing ideas that shaped the changes that were occurring in the world in the mid-80s and still are affecting the changes that we are facing in our society today. <clears throat> the problem with the Divinity School was when you graduate with the Masters of Divinity, you have to pay for it and there aren't that many jobs for people with that particular degree. <clears throat> so I came back home and started pounding nails again for a while and got this bright idea that I would go to law school. 
um, which in retrospect, I'm wondering about the wisdom of that decision. Maybe like I'll be questioning the wisdom of my decision to run for judge, depending on how the election goes. But having said that, um, the decision was an excellent decision. I came back home to my hometown in Forest Grove uh, 20 years ago. I hung out a shingle, started my own law practice. My parents were older, so I naturally was aligned with the older folks in the community. Um, and then I made the mistake of raising my hand in a forum that was presented by the Washington County Department of Aging. And I asked them what they were gonna do about elder abuse. And what they did is they put me on a committee. Um, and since then, I've been on multiple committees and task forces. I was one of the founding members on the Washington County Elder Abuse uh, Multidisciplinary Team. I served in the Forest Grove Senior Center Board of Directors. I was on Governor Kulangowski's Elder Abuse Task Force in 2004, where key legislation was passed for elder abuse. I was on the uh, Washington County Disability Aging and Veteran Services Advisory Council. Um, and I was a founding member of what was uh, Forest Grove Senior GAP, a, a program started by the Forest Grove Senior Center, which was taken over by Impact Northwest, which provides guardianship services and conservatorship services to uh, people on a sliding scale basis. <clears throat> Washington County needs more judges. One of the reasons I'm running for election is not necessarily to win, but also to bring attention to the issue that Washington County has grown tremendously. There were 150,000 people in Washington County when I graduated from high school. Now there's over 550,000. During that period of time, one judicial position has been created. We have half the number of judges in Washington County per capita as Multnomah County has. Um, I'm experienced, I've been working as a pro tem judge, and I wanna bring my experience to bear for all the voters. I'm not asking for votes because I want a job. I'm asking for votes to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, formerly known as Tom, never to be known as Tom again. The ballot, Tim. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I should introduce the, our next uh, candidate as Fred, but I won't do that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Sims. Thank you. For years, people used to call me Tim to sort of force the rhyme with Sims, but once email came around, I had to correct them and say, no, it's actually Ted, and if you say it, Tim, it won't get to me. Um, let me start with a point of agreement. I think that's one of the nice things about being in a nonpartisan uh, race. You don't get up pointing fingers at each other because your you're both intention is to get the job done for the people of Washington County. And getting the job done for Washington County, since I have limited time, I will say that we are definitely envious of Multnomah County, which is not yet up to 800,000 population. They have 38 judges and five referees. Washington County is getting close to 600,000. There's only 14 of us. Um, I'm not trying to plug myself as a hard worker, although I happen I think, to be, but it's just a reality of the job, uh, with the exception of coming out on occasions like this. I eat lunch at my desk almost every day, um, not because I'm antisocial, but because those are the time restrictions. Um, sometimes that plays out poorly for staff. Um, I got a little bit of grief last month. I kept a jury until almost 2 in the morning because I had 52 cases on my criminal docket uh, the following Monday and there was simply no way to make things happen. The jury was willing to work, they wanted to work, I let them work. Uh, and that's the kind of constraints that we have uh, under the system, we, the limitations, staff limitations we have right now. Um, personally, for those of you who don't know me, and that's probably a few in the room, um, I'm a third generation practitioner in Oregon. My grandfather started uh, the firm in 1903 down in Sheridan um, and I've been in private practice since 1980 for 35 years until I took an appointment uh, in January, so I'm, I'm just starting my fourth month, uh, <laughs> month on the bench. Um, what I bring to the job, bes besides just the years uh, of practice, is a fairly broad background in private practice. I've had a number of practitioners that, with uh, either a smile or a smirk, depending on the person, have described me as one of the last of the great general practitioners. Uh, and I take it as a compliment. I think in most instances um, it is because my background includes handling contested probate, guardianship, conservatorship uh, matters, uh, representing a number of small businessmen, uh, doctors, dentists in their practices, 
Um, I was a plaintiff's lawyer on the tort side, uh, helping people who'd been injured through no fault of their own uh, in a number of, of instances. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, this morning uh, on, this, on the civil motion docket, I had a lady in front of me who was contesting a garnishment of her bank account, unrepresented. The bank's attorney was there, had pretty well convinced her that the $1,000 that they had taken from her uh, account, a different bank, of course, um, that they were entitled to it because she lost her wage exemption uh, because they didn't garnish her employer, they garnished her bank account after she'd put her wage check in there. And I said, no, wait, wait, wait just a second here. And I checked the statutes and my memory was accurate. The exemption is not lost. And I split it 75-25, which is the right result. And they, I think the bank's attorney was a little bit embarrassed that, that they I may have promised their client that they were going to get away with this, and that wasn't right. And uh, I viewed the job essentially um, within the time res restrictions and staff restrictions that we have. The job is to get it right. Um, I checked my personal desires at the door. Um, I've had attorneys already trying cases in front of me that I used to litigate against in private practice. I haven't drawn a single affidavit of prejudice. I will eventually, just like eventually the Court of Appeals will overrule one of my decisions. That comes with the job. But my goal is, is to get it, uh, get it right and get it right the first time. Um, and I hope to be around for another six years to keep doing that. And I'd love to have questions because I've learned in appellate appearances when you get questions, you know what, what the audience has heard that you said and you know what they're interested in. So I'm sure that would go for Mr. Marvel as well. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, we have one questioner lined up, and uh, we've got about five minutes for questions is all. So please, Jim. Um, Jim Cape, former member, both question, both candidates complained about the Washington County judgeships. The answer is simple. It's redistricting. Based on redistricting, Multnomah County citizens are 1.1 Oregonians, and Washington County citizens are 0.9 Oregonians. The problem is no one is willing to stand up to the Multnomah County Democrats. They're special. Washington County people aren't special. So if you're going to complain about it, put up the names. Who isn't standing up for Washington County? Who isn't doing their job? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, in a judicial campaign, you know, we're limited to what we can say in a campaign. We can't uh, take a position, endorse uh, anybody else for political office besides another judge. And that applies to candidates as well as sitting judges. So I can't sit here and name names to you and what should or should not be done, except that I agree wholeheartedly with the proposition that Washington County seems to be in the squeeze and we don't have the resources, especially the judicial resources that, uh, that Multnomah County has. Um, but besides that, I'm, if you're asking me to name a bunch of politicians or somebody that are not doing their job, I, I'm not going to go there with you on that one. Sorry. Okay, let me put it this, this way. One of the things that you learn in life, to, if you're going to get by, uh, when you get lemons and having a, a contest here is lemons, you make lemonade out of it. So what I've done, I went out and... Um, well, put it this way, there are 14 state and uh, state legislators, uh, Senate and, and House representatives that have bits and pieces of Washington County in their district. Um, to my knowledge, three have not endorsed. I have the endorsement of the other 11, so they are now on my Rolodex, and I fully intend, because it's allowed under the Judicial Code of Ethics, to lobby them for the resources we need. I'm not going to point fingers at any of them who haven't been doing their job, as far as I know they have, but I do intend to hold their feet to the fire. Uh, but I suspect the problem lies more in the influence that Multnomah County has had, as the question put it, rather than lack of diligence on our own representatives, because uh, I've, I've met with uh, a number of them, um, and they are very supportive of our need for that, and I think we're going to be able to, to get it. So that's my take on it. Thank you to ev well to all of you guys that are here and asking good questions and listening to some really good presentations. But please, a moment. Thank you very much to, to Ray Lister, Rich Vile, John Boylston, Tim Markle, Ted Sims, Commissioner Rogers. Really appreciate you guys being here. 
Coming up next week, we have a good look. I know it's the day before the election, but we're going to get a break from election stuff. We have a good look at what's happening in early childhood education in Washington County. Following that, we have a, an interesting conversation about endangered species in Oregon. I'm sorry, that's referring to animals. No particular politicians will be addressed that day. And coming up, just to, to kind of warn you, June 6th, we're going to have a visit from a Republican, well, he's not a candidate. Uh, uh, we're going to have an interesting visit. We're going to have President Abraham Lincoln here. And I'm being honest. When he comes on June 6th, the president will give a presentation and we'll have 30 minutes where people will, the audience, will get to ask questions. But you will all be playing the roles of reporters in a scrum in 1867. That's June 6th. Don't worry about getting period clothing. You can come as you are, dress in whatever you want. But we figure if we could revive the president, it should be a darned exciting uh, day. That's June 6th, but we have a few things to get through before then. Ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you to our guests, and we'll see you next week.